And I believe that we are live now. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be answering an email and dealing with uh, what I'm titling the Toilsome Calvinism Departure, or a Toilsome Departure from Calvinism. I received an email from someone not long ago uh, detailing some of, and what stood out to me about this email was that the kinds of things that happen when leaving Calvinism are the same kinds of things that happen to a lot of other people. There's a pattern, there's gaslighting, there's second guessing. And uh, hello, y'all in the chat. Hello from Fort Bragg and Scott and Jeffrey and Roddy, Kayla, um, Nick, it's good to see y'all. Um, there's a pattern of of games, of gaslighting, word games, things like this that go on when people are leaving Calvinism. But not only, you see, leaving a belief system itself might be, might seem trivial, might seem small. Like perhaps you can imagine watching a documentary film on a particular topic and you become convinced that, oh, maybe the tuition in colleges is too high or something like that, you know? And when you're changing your mind about a couple things, it may not seem like that big of a deal. But when people are changing their mind about these kinds of things, <clears throat> they ha the person going through it has no idea how far reaching this transition is going to hit. And they... They make one change, they start questioning one thing, and then it's it's a little different to where each change they make, they realize, oh, they start to realize how far the rabbit hole goes, and then they start to uh, second guess themselves, like, am I doing the right thing here? Am I doing the wrong thing? Have I made a mistake? Because these kinds of transitions wind up costing people their in-group, their societal, the people they hang out with, their their social sense of self. It's a huge blow to their identity construction, their ego. And I don't mean ego as in uh, conceited and arrogant. I mean your mental vision of who you are as a person really takes a hit. Kind of like it's, it's probably a similar transition to maybe a divorce or something like that. Lots of things are changing in life. It's, it's not as simple as just coming to see something as no longer true. It's, it's much more involved in that. You don't, you don't realize that how much when, they're, when propositional affirmation is the normative feature of an in-group, you don't realize how much that in-group reaches into all the little dark crevices and recesses of your life until you start to make a departure and then you realize how many tentacles and webs are still tied in other places that you didn't realize were there. How many, <clears throat> how many tendons you have to sever to make a clean break. So when people are going through something like this, it is, it is very, uh, is very difficult in their life to make this kind of transition. So when I read this email, I want you to really have grace with the person who wrote the email, and I don't want you to jump to conclusions. And uh, I see some more folks in the uh, in the chat. Welcome aboard, good to see you. Good to see you, Idol Killer here. And uh, Julia, hello. Good, uh, good seeing you here. Julia said it was a similar transition as becoming a Christian, that ground shaking. I mean, imagine um, transitioning from Islam to Christianity, for example, in, in an Islamic country, how difficult that might be, something like that. So when you're surrounded yourself, when everybody that you look up to is of this ideology, and then you suddenly come to the level of cognitive awareness to where you no longer think that the ideology is valid, you don't realize at first how many things this affects. And you have this delusion 
that you can just basically kind of keep living your life like you did, inter- interfacing with the same people that you did, going to the church the same way, not realizing that all this stuff, those people are not really relating to you as a human being. They are relating to the ideology as long as you are a, a proxy of it. As long as you are an avatar of the ideology, you are their friend. And as soon as you are not, you are the enemy. Now, they would never come out and say that, but that's how their body feels about it because they've attached their identity. That's why it's so important to understand uh, cognition is because you need to understand what people's body is doing. Somebody can look you in the face and say, you know, we may disagree on on these 52 doctrines, but you're still my brother or sister in Christ and I'll always love you. They, they say that because they're supposed to say that, but their body is, t- is under threat and it feels like when you discount, when they've identified themselves with an ideology, whenever you call that ideology into question, it feels like to their body that you're attacking their identity. And then they start going into fight or flight mode around you. And then they start doing passive aggressive things. They start maybe using manipulative techniques. Um, all sorts of things are happening. So, and I got some people in the chat saying exactly, yes, that's what happened to me too. So we're going to look at some of this. Now, if you enjoy the content that you get here, it's very important for me to say this, which I hate to have to do. But if you enjoy the content that you get here, I invite you to support the content. We're also on Facebook at Beyond the Fundamentals. We've got people liking us there every day. We post things on Facebook. All these videos get posted there. And for, uh, We need you to subscribe, hit the thumbs up button. That gives us more visibility on YouTube when people search for these kinds of topics. Share these videos. Hit the bell icon so you're notified. If you want to support financially, uh, Kevin at BeyondTheFundamentals.com is the PayPal. And our Venmo is Kevin-Thompson-418. We really appreciate those who generously support to keep us going. We could not do this without you. And I have to put that plug in there because that's, that's how we're able to do this, how we're able to afford to set the time, space, resources aside to put this content together for you. And then we have our vision statement as well, which is going to be posted on the About Us section of the up-and-coming website. So Sam says, my friend told me I have to stay in church. I disagree, otherwise my children won't have anyone to marry. Yeah, that that kind of thing. So let's get into this email and see what this viewer emailed said. Now, this is a female. I'll just tell you that because it's obvious. And she talks about when she married her husband, that kind of thing. So this person writes in and says, Hi, Kevin. I've been watching your videos on your channel. And by the way, there's six of these slides on your channel for some time. And I found the content very helpful and clarifying. I was first introduced to Calvinism in college, but I didn't really latch on to it until a few years later. I'm ethnically Jewish. Now, I hate to correct somebody on how they describe themselves, but Judaism is a religion, not an ethnicity. The the ethnicity is Hebrew. But anyway, uh, she's born into Judaism. I'm ethnically Jewish and was brought up into practice culturally. I had a bat mitzvah and went to temple and celebrated holidays. You say, what's a bat mitzvah? I've heard of a bar mitzvah. Um, A bat mitzvah is a bar mitzvah for women. That's what it is. Um, bar mitzvah, sons of the commandments, bat mitzvah, bat mitzvah, daughters of daughter of the commandments. Okay, I had a it's a coming to it's a coming of age ceremony for Jews when they turn thirteen. So she had a bat mitzvah, went to temple, celebrated the holidays, etc. and so forth, but not in a religious way. And I know a lot of people in Italy like that who are Christian by practice but don't believe any of it. My neighbor, his name was. David, David, and he wanted, he was very important to him to take his daughter to mass and have her baptized as a baby and, and go through confirmation, all this stuff. But he was an atheist, didn't believe any of it, (laughs) but wanted his daughter to have all those Catholic experiences. So since childhood, I had a really intense mental health struggle and had difficulty making friends. Now, there is going to be some mental health discussion in this email, and I don't want any of you in the audience watching this to jump to conclusions to say, oh, it's just, uh, you can, it's just sin, prayer, and demons, and if you just turn to Jesus in prayer, you can get rid of all this stuff. It's not that simple. There are some, there are some mental health struggles that are very real, and uh, just like you can have problem with your liver or your heart, 
or any other part of your body, there are, there are legitimate issues with the mind uh, that need to be taken care of. And uh, I, I advocate that people seek professional licensed help for mental health issues, okay? Um, the, it's like John Verveke said, before you try these meditation practices, if you notice that there's some trauma coming up, stop and go seek the advice of a licensed professional immediately. And I, I would tell you the exact same thing. Always recommend you to a licensed professional. <clears throat> so there's really intense mental health struggles. The anxiety and depression got very severe when I was around 13. I developed anorexia and tried to take my life not too long after that. Accidentally deleted that. Now, a lot of people get judgmental when you see that somebody is suicidal. But suicidal ideation, in my opinion, is very typical of being in an ideology which leaves you nowhere to go which it can be nihilistic. And I'm not saying Judaism is nihilistic, but there's a, I was raised independent Baptist in the church we all went to back in Tampa. There's people, it seems like people are just dropping like flies from suicide or, or even earlier than that, they were dropping like flies from doing stupid things, you know, like drug overdoses and car wrecks, uh, in the stolen cars, that kind of stuff. Um, People, you know, these very promising, young, wonderful Christians wind up killing themselves when they get to be right around my age. Somewhere, it's it's like a it's like a pandemic. It's an epidemic. It's very serious. And I will confess that I have been suicidal at times in my life. And the difficulty of suicidal ideations and thoughts is that it's it forms a groove in your head and it's almost like magnetic. If you've ever seen that spike ball net in the middle of the net, imagine it's surrounded by elasticity and, and that thought of suicide seems to be the go-to thought when any difficulty hits and you try to move it out of the way and you have to really struggle to keep it out of the way. And as soon as you relax, it pops back in as the central thought. And that's, um, it's very difficult for a person to get over that kind of uh, thought inertia when they're so so nihilistic from not feeling like they have any legitimate options that that's where their mind is a lot. And then it's hard to get your ni- mind not to be there. Okay, So I sympathize with this person. As a teen, I was sent to several psychiatric hospitals and residential treatment centers. Slide number two. There were some very negative and I think possibly traumatic experiences that I still struggle with remembering today, even though I'm almost 23 now. Eventually, so I don't know what these are. Negative and possibly traumatic experiences that I still struggle with remembering today, even though I'm almost 23 now. Eventually, my mom removed me against medical advice. And after coming home, I watched a movie about Jesus and became really interested started reading the Bible on my laptop, and believed in him. That's very interesting. It's very interesting to me. I think that's fascinating. This was around six or seven years ago. So I guess that would put this event, which I guess we would classify this as an evangelical style conversion to Christianity, around the age of 17 or 16. I got baptized at a, at a local messianic fellowship because remember she is uh, Jewish. So now she's going to a messianic Jewish fellowship. Got baptized there. Started attending sometimes. After graduating, I went to a Christian college. I don't know which one. I was unsure of what to do with my life and I started to feel suicidal again. This time it scared me a lot because I was a Christian. Now... Slide number three. Around this time, I was introduced to the doctrines of grace. Now, for those of you who don't know it, the doctrines of grace is the code word for Calvinism. And the reason Calvinists say words like doctrines of grace or reformed theology or sovereign grace theology, the real reason they use those terms is because they don't want 
ordinary average Joe Pew sitter people to immediately get the idea that they're following the wrong, the wrong JC. They're following John Calvin instead of Jesus Christ. If you just say Calvinism, we're like, who's that? You know, and well, that's somebody from the, uh, from the 1500s. Well, what's that got to do with Jesus Christ? Absolutely nothing. Well, obviously not. So why are you following him? Well, they don't want to have to face those questions. So instead, they, they gloss it over. So Calvinism is all word games. It is all word games to try to fit in something that is unchristian. Yes, very unchristian and disguise it as Christian. So it's, it's buttery and slippery and subtle and smooth and deceptive and everything is kind of, kind of laced over with, uh, to make it a little more subtle, a little less noticeable. So they try to, try to be as, as, as unnoticed as possible, slipping these things in there, planting their little logic bombs inside your head. Um, Doctrines of Grace is a reference to the tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And it's odd that that's the name because we have a video called There is No Grace in Calvinism. There is no grace. There's no grace in total depravity. There's no grace in unconditional election. There's no grace in limited atonement. There's no grace in irresistible grace. And there's no grace in perseverance of the saints. There's no grace in any of the five doctrines which is interesting. Even, even Charles, no, Charles, R.C. Sproul himself uh, used the word rape in his book when he's discussing what happens with um, irresistible grace. And I hate to do this online while I'm going live, but it just occurred to me that I just saved a reference to that in my phone recently and it might be helpful to point it out what uh, our, it might be on my iPad instead of on my phone and my iPad is on the other side of the room anyway I'm not just saying this stuff frivolously okay um, so introduced to the doctrines of grace I ended up dropping out moving back home and had a season where I fell deeply into sin again and again now, I don't know what this sin is, right? And I'm guess, I guess it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> My husband and I met online, and we got married when I was 19 and he was 26. Now, I, I guess I'll be a little judgmental here. I got married the first time when I was 22, and I think that was too young. Now, the previous generation, most of them could say, well, we got married when we were young and it worked out just fine. And uh, my parents got married. My dad was 26, 25, and my mom was 17. And, you know, they were one of those stories that worked out fine. Well, until it didn't. They got divorced after 44 years. And I don't think that... I don't think... <laughs> It's a good idea to be getting married super young in this kind of society, the way we have things now. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel like I'm coming down with cold after cold after cold. Just got over my last one, started getting a new one. During the lockdown, we were living in my parents' basement and watched the American Gospel film. Now, for those of you who don't know it, the American Gospel films, I think it came out on Netflix and it comes across as a documentary thing. Now, what's interesting to me, what stood out about the American Gospel film, let me tell you the sly deception and manipulative tactics in this. It's a Calvinism promotion film, but they cleverly avoid any promotion of anything that is distinctively Calvinistic. Okay, They don't come out and promote their doctrines and show you why they're so wonderful. What they do is they show a bunch of off-the-wall things that they think are wrong and perversions of the gospel, and they present all of these things as if their belief is the default go-to option once you've turned away from all these others. Do you see the difference there? Do you see the difference? There's an out-of-sight, out-of-mind principle. Okay, when, when you don't have visibility on something, it's difficult to envision it. 
And when you don't have visibility on their beliefs, so they'll, they'll I forget exactly, it's been you know, a little while since I've watched it, but I think they talk about the Bethel movement for a while, and they have some girl on there talking about how wicked and wrong it was, and they talk about some of the tongue-speaking guys and the kundalini spirit. They talk about all these things that are so evil and wrong, and they never promote themselves and talk about what's so right about them, but they present all these other things as if becoming a Calvinist or join, like believing what they believe, all the preachers they show, you see, they show Paul Washer and some other clowns on there, all the preachers they show, that that is the way to avoid all this rampant error out there. And they present it in such a way that can be daunting to a lay person who's kind of new to this. Like, I'm, I, I didn't know there were all these different versions of Christianity and there's something so wrong with so many of them. How do I know how to sort them out? Well, we'll, we'll help you sort them out. We'll help you. Just come to Brother Melms. We've got it figured out for you. Just out since you're, you know, outsource your sense making to us. And we will do all the thinking for you. So then they, they're not really being converted to Christianity or any good version of it. Um, they're being converted to Brother Melms. I mean, if anybody else were doing the American Gospel film, you could throw the errors of Calvinism in right alongside all those other groups that they are bashing in that video. And you could say, what's wrong with them? Why not put Fred Phelps and his daughter on there? Uh, the Westboro Baptists, they were Calvinists. Why not put them on there? Why not talk about the evils inherent and rampant throughout that, the adherence to that ideology? Well, they don't do that, all right? It's cherry picking. It's not exactly above board. It's a very, um, <laughs> it's a very deceptive way to present things. <clears throat> reading some of these comments over here. So the American Gospel film is a is a very sly, manipulative, subtle trick of the mind where they present all these bad things with making it feel like the Calvinistic undertones and these Calvinistic preachers and speakers that they're featuring, that's the only way to avoid all these other bad things. And that that's deceptive, manipulative. So they started doing some research. She started doing some research and got more convinced of Calvinism. Notice how that worked. It seemed to be the answer to the, notice this, seemed to be the answer to the prosperity motivational messages I heard elsewhere. So you see all these other errors and that's how Calvinism presents itself. It's not just in the American gospel film, but uh, avatars of Calvinism in many, many different, areas, arenas, domains, they do the exact same kind of thing where they don't present how wonderful they are. They present how horrible it is to be a Pelagian or how horrible it is to believe in works salvation. Well, they think everyone who doesn't agree with them believes in works salvation, which is not true, or how horrible it is to be a Catholic or an Arminian or any of these other things, all the while acting like being in with them is the one and only solution to how horrible all those things are. So instead of actually promoting the merit that their ideology offers, which is terrible, by the way, as soon as they started being honest about it, you'd be like, what on earth is this? This is terrible. This isn't better than what I came from. <laughs> so, so then, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it, it, people are like I, I knew a guy in New Orleans when he was young and he's old enough to be my dad now. But when he was young, somebody asked him, are, are you a Calvinist or Arminian? He's like, I don't know the difference. And, was like, and he said, well, which one believes in uh, eternal security? And they said, Calvinist. Do. Well, I guess I'm a Calvinist. That's, it was like that for him. He didn't learn out later how much other stuff came with the packaging. Okay. <laughs> The, uh, in the comments, ESWN says, Remnant Radio has an interesting critique of the American gospel. So Remnant Radio, that would be interesting to go back and pick that up. Some years later now, I am deeply struggling. Some of the things that Alana L. said on the live stream the other day, I could relate to so much. So in case you missed that, that was a fun conversation that Alana was gracious enough to come on and have with me 
and I recommend checking that out when you get the time. Roddy says, I don't even believe Pelagius was Pelagian. And that's that's an accurate statement because if you actually look at we don't really hear a lot about what Pelagius actually believed. We hear about it through Polemic. And a Polemic is somebody writing against someone. In other words, we hear about Pelagius through Calvinists. We hear about it through the, through the lens of Augustine and through the lens of Calvin and not and through the lens of like John Owen. We don't really hear about Pelagius from Pelagius. Okay? And, and like many people have pointed out, Pelagius wasn't even a Pelagian as an accurate statement. Um, I was told that unless you're sovereign grace, you're putting your faith in your faith, which is another game they play. It's another manipulation game they play. It's a play on words. In case y'all are looking where I'm getting these from things or from the chat down here. I was told that unless you are sovereign grace, you're putting your faith in this in your faith. And that's that's what the Calvinists try to make you think. They're gaslighting you trying to make you think that you're, they had to twist it into somehow being works or self-trust or something like that. And Alana's getting a lot of shout outs here. So uh, we'll pass those along to her and I'm sure she appreciates that as well and finds it very encouraging. Some years later now, I am deeply struggling. Some of the things that Alana L said on the live stream the other day could relate to so much. So she's struggling and it's a struggle, all right? If you're out of Calvinism, it seems so cut and dry, but when you're, when you're in the midst of that plight, of that journey, it's not so cut and dry. I struggle with feeling assured of my salvation. That's interesting. That's, um, I knew a Calvinist, and his name was Mac Johnson, and he was the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in, on Stewart Street in Milton, Florida in the 1980s. And his deal was to preach everyone out of their salvation. He had everybody doubting their salvation, and his church was full of retreads. And what's a retread? It's somebody who they've made a profession of faith, and they're quote-unquote saved, but then basically they get talked out of their salvation, and they go forward to get saved again because they're convinced that for whatever reason they must not really be saved. And I'm not saying that that's unique to Calvinism, but in Calvinism, it, in, I don't see how it could be otherwise because you don't even know that Christ died for you. So the, where you look to for assurance of salvation is your own works in Calvinism. They're all not by works, not by works, not by works, but when it comes to assurance of salvation, it's all works because perseverance of the saints is not eternal security, by the way. Calvinistic eternal security is tied to their doctrine of election, not to perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints is that those who are truly elected and after they are regenerated will persevere in faith and good works. And the flip side of that coin is that if you do not persevere in faith and good works, the subtle implication here is as prescribed by the local Calvinist pastor then you must not be saved or elect, or if you are elect, you must not have been regenerated yet. So you got a bunch of people walking around like, what if I'm not elect? Like, would I, would I look at that woman with lust if I was really elect? You know, would I have these thoughts? You know, there's, there's no shadow. There can be no shadow work in Calvinism. It has to be all denial. And that's why the people never grow and never come out of their ego. Because there's no shadow work. There's no admission and integration of what the person really is in their subconscious. they just in denial of what they really are. So they can never deal with their shadow. Because they have to be in denial of it in order to keep convincing themselves that they're really elect or really regenerated. So she's struggling with feeling assured of her salvation. She feels anxious often, sometimes before praying. And worried that I could get caught in a trap. I'm not sure... Um, what kind of trap she has in mind there. Maybe it's the kind of, who are taken captive by the devil at his will, Second Timothy 2, toward the end of the chapter. Elizabeth L. says, she was insecure because of looking to my works and obedience. And that's what Calvinism does. They tell you, well, you know, the 
on the the mechanics of salvation is if you're elect, you're elect and you can't get out. And if you're regenerated, you're, you're sealed in for good. But there's no way to know if you're elect or regenerated except your own works. That's the only way to know. You can't even know if Christ died for you because he only died for the elect. And that goes back to being confused about what it is that saves. And I'm frustrated with the provisionists for taking a, a half Calvinistic approach on the atonement. They don't even realize they're doing it. But I would like to open that conversation with them one day. <clears throat> I was also diagnosed with, as having ASD. That is uh, autism spectrum disorder as a teenager in one of the psych hospitals. Now, here's a question. Do you think being on the spectrum could cause someone to be vulnerable for Calvinism? My, my short and unqualified, let me stress that. My short and unqualified answer is yes. And the reason I will say that is for a few things. When it comes to the growth the growth of Christians. And if you look at it through the work of Ian McGilchrist and his hemispheres, autism, very left hemisphere. Um, Calvinism, independent fundamental Baptist, anything that is very strictly doctrinaire in the sense of propositional doctrines rather than scriptural doctrines, very left hemisphere. And the left hemisphere likes to make things explicit it has no appreciation for the implicit, has no appreciation for metaphor. It thinks metaphor is a lie. It wants to take poetry and turn it into prose. That's, that's the left hemisphere. It cannot handle any of these other things. And so because of the similarity through, through my layperson's understanding of the hemispheres of the brain, because of the similarities and the tendency toward and now, not just ASD, not just autism spectrum disorder, but cluster B personality disorders, in my opinion, also lend one toward Calvinism, as well as perhaps the scrupulosity found in a cluster A personality disorder of being obsessive compulsive disorder. So that's possible as well. Okay. And they used to call that scrupulosity and, and, what happens is a lot of people become very scrupulous with their theology, but the problem is they don't know any better than to do that, to, to exercise that scrupulosity at only the propositional level, at the systematic theology level. So there's no process, there's no perspective, there's no participation, there's no relevance realization, there's no let's look at the lens and evaluate it, there's no external, uh, there's no contemplation, there's no ability to look outward, ability to look inward. There's no ability to identify the lens through which one is looking and then identify the lens to see how good it is, clean it off, and then try it again. There's no ability to do any of that in the left hemisphere. You have to be uh, working back in the right hemisphere in order for that to start happening again. So these, the fact that those things overlap with emphasis on left hemisphere causes me to say, yes, I do think that would make somebody more vulnerable, not just to Calvinism, but to any kind of systematized type of proposition-based theology would attract people who were very scrupulous, okay? Look at some of these comments. <clears throat> also think that having a bad childhood and having trauma leaves you vulnerable to Calvinism. Well, also, bad childhood and trauma leaves a person vulnerable to certain kinds of personality disorders as well, especially if they happen, depending on when they happen, how old the person is. And um, there's some talk about provisionism, that kind of thing. All right, and problem with provisionism is that it is also stuck at that at that left hemisphere level and so i want to do a video on this but I, I think there's a progression of growth that a person if if someone is going to have calvinism in their life but then later go on to wake up and be a christian again there is a growth where vulnerabilities get exploited 
and then they have to make a lateral move to leave Calvinism before they can make a vertical move. Like you need to go from Calvinism to something like provisionism as a staging area so that you can understand, well, there's two paradigms here that will give you the perspective to maybe perceive that there can be not a third paradigm, but an above view of both of them to where you don't have to be inside either one. That's where you need to get, okay? That's except you repent. That metanoia, that metacognition is to be above the paradigmatic level, beyond the paradigmatic level, not within a paradigm. So going from Calvinism to provisionism is a lateral move. Sure, those most of the propositions are more in keeping with what one could derive from the Bible if you were viewing it propositionally as well, but you shouldn't do that either. <laughs> and that would be like, if you should, which you shouldn't. Watch our video on Mammon Church and several others. So that's, that's an issue, but I see those things as necessary stepping stones. Now, I think Marshall Davis went from, Cal- I think he skipped a lateral move and went straight up, but also abandoned his Calvinism when he did. Um, had some kind of, he, he entered into some kind of unitive awareness and left his Calvinism behind when he did that, which is very interesting. But yes, these kinds of things make people vulnerable to Calvinism. Um, <clears throat> I have struggled with thinking in, in perfection failure, black and white, my whole life, and that's, that's called splitting. It's either all or nothing. Like there's no such thing as a Christian who's a decent fellow who also smokes a cigarette every now and then. When, when I was a kid, and, and splitting is for kids and for people with disorders and for ideologues, which in my opinion is a type of disorder coming to you as a, as a former ideologue, okay? I was an ideologue, hardcore, independent, fundamental Baptist style ideologue. I had a little Calvinist stint for a little over a year one time. But yeah, I've been I've been an ideologue too. And when I was a kid, I had black and white thinking. I was trained that Christians should dress a certain way, do certain things, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run around with those who do, and, and all the guys had short haircuts and all the girls had long hair and the girl and the women wore shirts and dress, uh, skirts and dresses where the the men kept short hair and, and there's some independent Baptists who don't let men wear shorts and men can't even grow beards. <laughs> when I went to speak in California, uh the literally the day after I met Paula, I had to go speak in California, and the pastor there was trying to convince me to shave my beard before I spoke publicly because some people having a problem with it. I'm like, oh my goodness, where do these people come from? But I'm telling you, this the scrupulosity knows no end. Just every little thing, everything's black and white. So when I was a kid, I remember seeing people. If I saw somebody smoking a cigarette. To me, they weren't a Christian. If I saw them drinking a beer, they weren't a Christian and they were on their way to hell. If I heard them say a cuss word, they weren't a Christian. If I saw a guy with long hair, he wasn't a Christian. So as I, was, as I got a little older and then my parents loosened up a little bit and they started listening to the Gaithers, which that's gateway music to the world, by the way, if you're, if you're an independent fundamental Baptist. It's gateway music. It's just prepping you up for the world's music if you listen to the Gaithers and the cathedrals. And the guy on the Gaithers... Gaither acapella album he had like long hair down past his shoulders and I was like how, how can this be possible if this is a Christian group I don't understand this <laughs> little things like this is like splitting all black and white and that is when you have splitting all black and white stuff you are vulnerable not just to Calvinism but to any kind of black and white type of proposition based theological system an in-group that is its normative feature is propositional affirmation you have to believe all these propositions in order to be part of the in-group why not we need to be seeking after the same transformational goals why why is belief even important when you get to a certain point you realize that the beliefs are there whether you hold on to them or not and therefore there is no reason to and back to this left-right hemisphere thing as well. Um, the the right hemisphere is really in charge of a child, ages one through four. And then they start to get their enculturation. It really starts to shift right around age five, typically. 
And then later on in life, you start to, when you start to mature, you get that second half of life wisdom, that second tier consciousness, you start to get back into the right hemisphere again. It's, but it's like a, it's not like the left hemisphere. It's not like the enculturation is bad. It's like a cocoon that's needed to, to marinate the true self so that it can come back out a little bit later. All right. Um, but we live in a left hemisphere dominant society, which is in the middle of a meaning crisis. So more people will stay there and never leave than might otherwise in a different kind of society. So that's the problem right now is that if um, they say as the, as the adult is, as the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. We don't have a lot of adults making it to sage stage. Okay, we have we have a lot of sage miscarriages that stay left hemisphere. They stay first tier consciousness. They stay first half of life wisdom. They stay stage one and two. That that doesn't matter what system you use, whether you're talking about Fowler stages of faith or spiral dynamics or integral theory or Erickson's models. It doesn't matter. That's that in our society we're going to have fewer and fewer people doing that. But but it really made me think that when when Jesus said, "Except you become as little children, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven," it made me think about that left and right hemisphere thing, how people are in the right hemisphere up until about age four, and then you get enculturated, and then you spend the next part of your life till you're maybe around thirty, forty, if you're on schedule, trying to break back out of that left hemisphere using that container, that cocoon to have developed your true inner self, but you have to realize that that true inner self is, your ego is not it. So this black and white stuff, I, strugg I, was, uh, I have struggled with thinking perfection, failure, black and white my whole life, and Calvinism was so appealing because it appeared to give all the answers. Now that's something else the left hemisphere demands. It demands to have answers. It demands to have certainty. The right hemisphere is more comfortable with nuance, subtlety, uncertainty, delayed responses, metaphor, ambiguity, the implicit. The right hemisphere needs to have everything now. It needs to be explicit. It needs to be sliced up into little itty bitty little consumable parts. It has no uh, appreciation for context. That's the left hemisphere. And so they come across as having all the answers and not realizing that as soon as you give an answer, especially when we're talking about something ineffable, okay? Something ineffable, if you try to disambiguate the ineffable, you may say or write something that a person can understand and grasp more easily than the thing, but you have to realize it's still not the thing. It is data reduction by far. You might be getting one-tenth of one percent of the thing, but because you understand it, 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 it scratches your certainty itch. I need to have certainty. Well, they can give you what you think is certainty and calm that itch, but you still don't know anything. See? That's the problem. Like Colossians 2.18, entering into those things that they ought not. They have no business entering into these things, making the statements that they make in any kind of systematic theology. And we can look back through church history and see how and why this all went wrong when they tried to make certain things explicit in the first place. But seriously, the Reformation, while it is admirable to quote-unquote try to get back to the Bible, what they really did was they emphasized a a propositional reduction of what was available in Christianity with no appreciation for the other three kinds of other three kinds of knowing other than propositional and the debate ensued on those grounds and then you have the council of trent 1525 and 26 and that that's the catholic church made a really wrong move there it would have been better if they would have admitted some of their errors and corruption but then not thrown out the baby with the bathwater, not have the fight at the propositional level. And as soon as they did that, there was, there was this, 
Imagine the wheat and the tares growing together in the Catholic Church. And I'm not saying it was good or it's the true church. I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is that there was a possibility to explore wisdom within Christianity. And the Protestant Reformation provoked the Protestants and the Catholics both to reduce everything down to propositions uh, in order to win at rivalry, which they are sacrificing 99.99999% of what Christianity and Jesus Christ have to offer by doing that. But that's that's the front on which they decided to fit the bat- fight the battle, and then that became the domain of Christianity from there forward, and especially evangelicals to this day, we're very nihilistic because we, we're very left hemisphere, we're very narcissistic because we have no idea the richness and depth of Christianity and Jesus Christ that is available to us if we hadn't made the mistake of following people who just reduced it all down to propositions for the sake of winning at rivalry. Christianity is not designed to win at rivalry. It's designed to help you transform into the image of Christ. And if you are rivalrous, you are working against that. And history has shown that. So I, I, I can't implore you enough. Whenever I disparage debating, people are like, well, how else are we going to know what's true? You're still thinking propositionally. There, you, you can't think that way. Look at Romans one twenty nine. You don't uh, look at the bedfellows of debate. It's not what you want, because it appeared to have all the answers. And that's and when I I'm going to use the word cult a few times, and the um, the point here is not to just pejoratively call Calvinism a cult, okay? But the comparison cannot be avoided. And when I say this, I say it, let's, let's open both eyes here. Let's look at the denotation, the connotation of cult, because the denotation of cult, by the denotation of cult, what do you mean by denotation, Kevin? I mean the dictionary definition of the word cult is any group of people that share similar beliefs. That's all it is. And by dictionary definition, any branch of Christians, any church, any denomination that has a statement of faith is a cult by dictionary. We use the word sect to talk in denomination to talk about different groups. And our Spanish speaking friends use the word cultos, where we say sect, cult, same thing. Now, connotation. The word cult has a very negative connotation to us because we typically associate that with a group that is a far-off splinter that has a unique leader like Joseph Smith with the Mormons, you know, Ellen G. White and some of these other people, these other groups. They, uh, you know, Pastor Rutherford, (laughs) Pastor Russell, our connotation is these like big, bombastic, charismatic cult leaders are pulling people after them, teaching crazy things like uh, you can have multiple wives or running a compound with a bunch of machine guns in everybody's hands or, or we're all going to go heaven's gate, we're all going to go wait, sell all of our stuff and give it all to the poor and go up on the top of the mountain and wait for the spaceship to come get us or you know the Jim Jones crowd. We're going to go out and drink Kool-Aid and kill everybody. When we think of cult, we think of that. So when I say cult, I'm not trying to say that Calvinism is exactly Jim Jones or exactly Mormonism. But you need to understand the mental dynamics of an in-group and what it does to the mind. There is a brainwashing that goes on when you're part of an in-group that is normalized What do you mean normalized? The main threshold of entry and of staying in is propositional affirmations. Here's our statement of faith. Here's all the doctrines we believe. We need you to agree to those and say you believe them too. You believe things at the propositional level. If if that is the thing and the the in-group is formed on that, it cannot but gaslight you. Cannot do otherwise. Okay? So if you ever 
start to rethink those. And also what it does, and I was just trying to convey this to somebody on Facebook today and they totally weren't getting it. But also what it does is it prevents you from growing. Because if I'm part of this in-group, if I'm part of a, if I'm a Southern Baptist because I accept the Baptist faith and message, then as soon as I start to explore and develop further than what the Baptist faith and message has to offer, by definition, I can no longer be in an in-group that is, has a normative function of propositional affirmation. Because I want to, I'm exploring processes, perspectives, and participation levels that go beyond those propositions. Um, so it's as soon as you sign on the dotted line and say, yes, you're also signing and you're agreeing to never grow again. That's what you're agreeing to do. And then anybody who does grow now seems like a heretic to you because you have agreed that nobody's allowed to go further than this. Nobody's allowed to go further than the seventh grade. And if anybody dares start to take pre-algebra in the eighth grade, I don't know, whatever then you are a heretic, that kind of thing. You just can't advance. Any advancement is evil. They define advancement. They define sin and evil and cults, all that kind of stuff, as, as progressing further than what they are, which is a really horrible way to do things. <clears throat> so that's, yeah, it's a very bad way to do things. We call that the mammon church, not, not a kind of church you want to be a part of. And the Jehovah's Witnesses get a lot of Baptists, and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons that get a lot of Baptists because Southern Baptists don't know their Bible at all. And, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about all of them. I'm just talking about 99.99% of them, you know, but the rest of them know their Bible pretty well. But just the 99.99%, they have no idea what is between the cover of those books. And so the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness show up at their little house Bible studies, and they start having answers. I'm like, wow, I never realized that before. I never saw that pass. I never saw that passage before. And they're the first ones to tell them about the Millennial Kingdom. You got to, that's why we call it the Kingdom Hall. You got to come to the Kingdom. There's going to be a it's going to be a Kingdom, a ruling and reigning a thousand years on this earth. You didn't know that? That's that's standard Baptist theology. That. Baptists think they're learning something new that the Baptists never showed them when the Jehovah's Witnesses come and point that out because they never get taught Bible and they never read their Bible. They don't know the Bible. And it's, it's sad. And that just typically happens. So uh, Calvinism is like that. And leaving Calvinism or leaving independent Baptists like it was for me is very taxing emotionally on the serotonin and cortisol systems and on the mental health systems and you start to doubt yourself and the phrase that I'm going to bring up probably a couple more times than just once is the idea of battered spouse syndrome like a battered what happens with a battered spouse you got a woman with two black eyes and you'll you'll hear them convince themselves that it's her fault that her husband hit her no, it's not ever. <laughs> it's not ever. Unless you were trying to shoot him or something, you know. Uh, but no, and she will be convinced that, oh, I should have arranged, I should have had dinner done a different way. It's, I caused this. I should have worn a different outfit. I caused this. You know, if it's happening at that level. And they'll actually think that. They actually think that's the case. That I, I, am I causing this? And I hear people talk, I, just, I was just on the phone. Well, I was just messaging with somebody the other day who recently came out of Calvinism. They were saying pretty much the same thing. They're, they're thinking that they are the cause of all the disunity and disruption whenever they left Calvinism because the pastor is gaslighting them, making them feel guilty. And he's having to now answer a bunch of questions which he wasn't prepared for because somebody left the church side they don't want to be Calvinist anymore. And they're trying to control that person making them agree to keep their mouth shut and not say, not say certain things to certain people. It's all deceptive. It's all manipulative. It's all gaslighting. And they make them think that it's their fault. This stuff's happening because of you. You know, these people were living nice, peaceful, graceful lives until you disrupted it with all your division. Do not listen to those people, okay? <clears throat> the church my husband and I are currently members of has studies with systematic theology from John MacArthur. And I think is Calvinistic leaning. 
Uh, yes. If your church is a fan of John MacArthur, it is Calvinistic leaning. If you're doing systematic studies with theology from John MacArthur, there's no I think about it. It is definitely Calvinistic leaning. This goes into the stealth Calvinism thing. Churches who are Calvinistic, they don't need to, they don't want to advertise the distinctives of their Calvinism. Just like the Manichaeans, the, Mana- the Manichaeans during Augustine's day, they around Christians, they would try to pass themselves off as Christian. Around Buddhists, they would try to pass themselves off as Buddhist. They would blend in with whatever group they were around to try to be as like chameleons. And Calvinists are, you know, the modern day Manichaeans are still like that to this day. Their goal is to slide under the radar very subtly with word games and smooth talk to make you think they are Christian. All right. The Christian meme complex has a certain set of ideas in it. It does not need Calvinism to be Christian. And Calvinism is a is an addition to that meme complex, which it's central meme of central meme of the meme complex of Christianity is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the authority of Scripture. That's the central meme of the meme complex of Christianity. The central meme of Calvinism is different than that of Christianity. It is total depravity. The idea that a person cannot hear the gospel, cannot want to hear the gospel, cannot respond to the gospel, cannot receive Jesus Christ, will not want to receive Jesus Christ, never will, any of that stuff. Total depravity. All right? You have to be transformed first, you have to be regenerated first, before you can be saved. That's the Calvinistic teaching. And so the, it is diametrically opposed to what's going on in the Bible. And the, the point there, when you study mimetics, memetics, not mimetics, there's, there's mimetics, Rene Girard, and there's memetics, Dawkins, okay? The, the replication of ideas in a society. And you could look at Christianity as a set of ideas. And when you do that, the thing that holds Calvinism together isn't the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the, huh, that's the mustard branches in which the fowls lodge themselves. The central meme of the meme complex of Calvinism is total depravity. That's the central meme of the Calvinistic meme complex. It, and it's try, and it's like a parasite. Like uh, it needs a host organism to embed itself in. It needs Christianity to exist. And it comes in and it plants, it's completely unnecessary. You don't need any of the Calvinistic distinctive features of its meme complex in order to be Christian. You don't need any of them, okay? Christianity is just fine without it. But like, like mistletoe or like a tapeworm or like something else, it needs a host body. Christianity is the host body in which this parasite comes and embeds itself like a cancer, all right? And grows in that way. So when I say something like, when I make little comments here and there distinguishing between Calvinism and Christianity. It's not just to sling mud or be pejorative. It's I'm, I'm being very technical here, very technically precise that it's two different things. Okay. You can have one without the other, but you can't have the other without the one. It's uh, it's like accessorizing yourself with something that hurts you. <laughs> it's kind of what it is. Somebody said, Kayla said, my, my grandparents used the JMAC study Bible, but didn't know what Calvinism was. And that's one of the problems with JMAC, John MacArthur, is that he's so, like he's on the radio, and he says a lot of things that a lot of Christians agree with. He makes a lot of statements about America and morality and getting back to the Bible. He makes, he, he's got all kinds of statements which make him attractive to non-Calvinists. And it's not until you start going down the rabbit hole a little bit further that you realize the embedded Calvinism that's in there, okay? And like I knew a church that was explicitly non-Calvinistic, but they highly revered John MacArthur and thought he was great. They had no idea. They just had no idea. And that's the, you run into that all the time. Just complete, completely ignorant. You know, ignorance is bliss, bliss. Uh, yeah, so if they're studying from John MacArthur, if the church is 
officially doing systematic theology. What they're trying to do is teach you Calvinism without calling it Calvinism. Calling it systematic theology, but by using John MacArthur's, the goal is to make sure everybody is uniformly Calvinistic. I'm in the place where I don't think it's true. Now notice that. That's her assessment. Like the way I see things, I'm not seeing this. Now what, a Calvin, what Calvinism tries to do is try to separate you from your own assessment of what you see. They want you to be ash positive. They want you, when you see that the line is shorter than all the other ones, even though everyone else is answering wrong, they want you to keep giving the wrong answer with everybody else instead of actually say what you see. She says, I'm in the place where I don't think it's true. I believe that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all. Sounds like there's a Bible verse that says that. Hello, 1 Timothy 2, 6. And we can receive him in faith. That makes perfect sense to me. Okay? But I constantly doubt myself. Why? And worry that if I, <clears throat> if I think that I believed myself, then that meant that's a work which I don't understand either because the Bible doesn't treat faith as a work. And this is, this is the mental manipulation game that Calvinism does to people. This doublespeak, it's word games. Calvinism is all word games. It's, uh, I've defined Calvinism before as clever post hoc rationalizations for why scripture isn't true. Cal scripture very clearly contrasts faith with works. It defines the works as the deeds of the law in Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 28. <clears throat> and then it refers to that loosely as works from there forward. And then it says, but to him that worketh not, Romans 4, 5, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it obviously contrasts faith with works. Well, Calvinism, with their idea that regeneration precedes faith, they have to talk you out of faith by trying to equivocate on the idea of what a work is, <coughs> excuse me, instead of using the biblical precedent of being the deeds of the law, is what they're essentially saying is the same thing Acts 15 is saying. Do not have to be circumcised to keep the law to be saved. Um, just believe in Jesus Christ. Well, they say, well, when, when I was in seventh grade science, I learned that any action is technically a work. So if you are faith, if you are exercising your faith, or if you believe, if you think your belief resulted in your salvation, you're trusting yourself, you're trusting your own work, you're not trusting the work of God because salvation is the work of God, he is the author and finisher of our faith, blah, 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 blah. More equivocation and deception and lies, etc. and so forth, ad nauseum. And they get you to doubt yourself. And it's difficult, especially when you're in a Calvinistic church, and there's nobody really to turn to that is also see like report, able to report what they see in Scripture. They're all outsourcing their sense-making to Brother Melms. They're all zombies, essentially. Landrew. You ever saw that Star Trek episode with Landrew? They're all following Landrew, right? And they nobody is thinking for themselves or looking at Scripture for themselves or is, a, is brave enough to deal with what 1 Timothy 2, 4, 2, 6 says, or, or any of the other umpteen million passages that deal with that kind of stuff. So they get you in self-doubt. You just self-condemnation, just like an abusive husband gets a wife to be in self-doubt. Maybe, maybe I did cause him to hit me. That's the kind of stuff that's going on. It's the exact same phenomenon going on in the mind. Listen to me. Trust your experience. Trust what you read. Trust your eyes. Okay? Exercise your senses both to discern, to discern both good and evil. Exercise that, calibrate that, and when you read something in the Bible, you can trust that. Don't let a Calvinist talk you out of what you see in the Bible. That's what it says. So this, they like to play word games and double speak and equivocate on what a work is. So then she goes on. Kayla said, it sounds like Calvinism attempts to reconcile not a work with you still got to get off the couch <laughs> kind of thing. I've been learning about Christianity. I often come by to study. That's Sarah Kennedy, 25. Welcome aboard. We're glad you're here. <clears throat> 
What we want people to do is pay attention to their experience. When you read something in the Bible, it very clearly says something. Understand framing, too. And then somebody's trying to teach you that it says something else. Um, go with what the text, go with what you see the text say, not with what they're trying to teach you. Bearing in mind that when they talk to you, they can use framing to make it seem like it's saying something it isn't saying. Especially on places like Romans 9. Romans 9 is uh, telling the Jews that God can harden and blind them and open salvation wide open to the Gentiles. And Calvinists try to make it look like that's the answer for why the Gentile in 2023 sitting next to you in the pew doesn't receive Christ, that Romans 9 is the reason for that. has absolutely nothing to do with that whatsoever. Actually has nothing to do with why any individual Jew doesn't get saved either. So she goes on to say, I'm at a point where it feels like I've been conditioned to dissociate from emotions and lived experience. And that is not good. Now, you don't want to be ruled by your emotions, but you want to have them calibrated so that they can inform you. Your body is constantly trying to tell you things. I've mentioned this before, where they did an experiment, I think Ian McGilchrist talks about this, where they were dealing blackjack hands from a blue deck of cards and a red deck of cards, and I forget which one was which, but let's say the blue deck of cards always, like most often gave a bad hand and the red deck of hearts most often gave a winning hand okay well it took it took participants an average of 80 deals to be able to verbalize that hey i think these decks are stacked and this one has more losing hands and this one has more winning hands but when they hooked them up to an eeg like a lie detector test kind of thing where they check out all their uh bodily vital signs and that kind of thing, their blood pressure and their keep an eye on their, whether or not they're sweating and their pupil dilation. After, in, while it took them up to 80 times to verbalize what they thought was going on, their body increased in anxiety when the dealer's hand went to the blue deck after just 10 deals. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that your body sometimes figures things out before you do in your head. And you don't want, and your, body, your emotions happen in your body. And you don't want your emotions to rule you, but you want to have them calibrated so that they can inform you and so that you know how to listen to them. So you can listen to what's happening in your body and figure out what it's trying to tell you. Now it takes time. It takes time to calibrate that. And it's, I, I usually can't say anything about that without somebody trying to say that, oh, you can't live by feelings and emotions. I'm not trying to tell you to live by them. I'm trying to tell you is to uh, calibrate them so that they can be incorporated. And over time, you will learn what it is telling you. <clears throat> so, And then lived experience. And that takes us to Romans chapter 5, where an experience worketh hope. Experience is part of the... I can actually go over here to the scripture to show you. Experience is a huge part of how a Christian should be learning and growing. When you look in Romans chapter 5. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulations work with patience and patience experience and experience Hope and hope make not a shame. Maybe the reason people who are Calvinists have no hope is because they're constantly getting talked out of their experience. If if tribulation works patience and patience works experience and experience hope, those are some things that you need. It's very, very important to pay attention to experience. Focus in on it. And if you don't get used to listening to experience, you're never going to hear that still small voice. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That full experience of love includes experience. You need these things. You need emotions. You need lived experience. 
<laughs> she goes on, having not grown up in church and leaving my own religious in-group to follow Jesus, attachment to the in-group is not so much of a problem. What I do struggle with intensely is what I think is scrupulosity. And I think Calvinist teachings have been of help, have not been of help to grow. In other words, Calvinist teachings are exacerbating the scrupulosity problem. And scrupulosity. Let's see here. You say, what's scrupulosity? I don't have this on the slides, but I'm going to Google it real quick. Scrupulosity. Definition is a psychological disorder uh, primarily characterized by pathological guilt or obsession associated with moral or religious issues is often accompanied by compulsive moral or religious observance and is highly distressing and maladaptive. Okay, scrupulosity. So what I do struggle with is intent with intensely is what I think is scrupulosity, and I think Calvinist teachings have not been of help to grow. So they're exacerbating exacerbating the scrupulosity problem. Can you imagine you don't have assurance of your salvation in Calvinism. You can't. Now they say they do, but they're just lying through their false teeth. You can't have assurance of salvation in Calvinism. And the perseverance of the saints thing constantly has you examining yourself, which makes you unempathetic toward other people, makes you narcissistic, and, and, and it could make you self-referential in a, in a negative way as well. You think of narcissistic as some kind of egotistical, bombastic kind of person, but it could also make person make a person self-referential in a low esteem kind of way as well. So you're constantly looking to your works and your behavior and your thought life to see whether or not you're elect or regenerated. And of course, because we are like we are, you're always thinking you aren't. And so the scrupulosity, you're just constantly on edge, torturous by these thoughts, wondering whether you're in or out. Today I was in tears quietly for a significant portion of the church service and I feel really tired. I kind of feel, that's why I said the, the tiresome, the tiresome departure from Calvinism. That's why we titled this correct, like this. I kind of want to change churches but also have absorbed the suggestion that not going to or serving in a local church for whatever time or reason is sinning and indicates you probably aren't saved. There it is again. There's that scrupulosity thing. And the thing, see, perseverance of the saints, it, lordship salvation is a roundabout kind of way. Once you tell people that they're, you know, saved if they're elected, you, now you have to find some way to control their behavior. Because if they have been told that they're elect, there's, no reason to prefer the prescriptive will of God over the decretal will of God. Because even if you disobey the Bible, as if you're a Calvinist, you know that it's the decretal will of God. So, uh, perseverance of the saints is a man-made doctrine designed pe to keep people within what is perceived to be the pres prescriptive will of God, the percep preceptive will of God, the precepts, the do's and don'ts. Do this, don't do that. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Colossians 2. Okay. Now, here's the problem with church. Is, um, we have this verse in the Bible, Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, you know, because you need to love and provoke one another to good works. Absolutely, Christians should assemble together and they should do that. But problem, the other thing I want you to think about is this. I want you to think about your relationship with a particular in-group, kind of like your relationship with a significant other. Emotionally, emotionally, when it's time to leave one in-group or, or you need to assess yourself, right? It's not good to be in a serious relationship when you're doing self-work, okay? And there are times, and me and Nick have said this many times to each other, and I think several times on the channel, that, yeah, we advocate reading the Bible. We think we should 
read, love, know the Bible. But there, some people, because they have a framing issue and because they have an association issue and because they have like moderate to severe or mild forms of trauma associated with certain modalities of spiritual input, you need to step away for a while. It is completely okay, completely fine to step away from the, for a while. Some people need to spend some time away from the Bible so that they can come back to it without the framing that they had on it before. And... Not that I advocate that people don't expose themselves to Scripture. That's not the point. But if you think of everything uh, from birth to death as a linear thing, just think of, of time as like something that you can apply to something to reframe it and perhaps make it uh, come back in a, in a truer form. Okay, Some people are... One thing in Ian McGilchrist's book, The Master and His Emissary, I think in chapter 11... It's talking about whenever you perceive reality, you are half of what you're getting is perception and half is creation. In other words, the left hemisphere of your mind takes everything familiar and instead of actually letting you see the thing for the first time, it's recreating most of your experience from things that you've already experienced. Now, when you're deep down studying the Bible every day, what happens is you get a buildup of this. And you might call it like a, like a buffer overflow almost, something like that in technological terms, to where you are actually almost getting zero Bible and your left hemisphere is creating more of what you are perceiving to be Bible than the Bible itself is. Well, how do you address that? One thing to do, among others, is to step away for a while. Step away. Go back and get, like, let life experience talk to you for a while. Practice looking at things with a fresh mind, with the right hemisphere. Practice perceiving things in that way. And sometimes you need to get away from an in-group for emotional reasons, and you're not exactly ready for another in-group. Now, I also left a church for a while that was... Uh, I wasn't ready to go back to church because what happened was absolutely terrible. Wasn't ready to go back to church. And uh, everything reminded me of trauma and I, I felt it kind of seemed like every pastor was potentially just as corrupt as the one who had done this horrible thing that I knew about. And I just wasn't ready. I, I could not have gotten from church what you should get out of church. And if you set aside a period of time where you're breaking away and reframing, it's not like you're forsaking the assembly altogether for the duration of your life. Right? It's like you're stepping away for a while. Okay? When you break up from a romantic relationship, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't believe in romantic relationships. It means that you need some time alone for a while, need some time away. Do not, when, when this happens, and I think I can say this because Alana was on the channel, but she left a Calvinist church and their family, they're kind of like, what do we do now? And you need to realize, yeah, well, you need to be in church, but you need, to, you need to understand it's okay not to be. When I was going through my period where I just couldn't go through church, there was a certain person that was close to me, a family member, not my wife at the time, who was very active in their church. And they're like, well, you just need to be in church. You don't want to be out of the will of God, that kind of, you know, giving that whole speech, you know. And at this very moment, they are where I was. They are completely disenchanted with it. Don't want to go. Don't want to be there. And they spent some. They, now they got a taste of it, and they understand. But people who have not gone through the suffering, they don't understand. You know, there's, there's no hate like Christian love, <laughs> they say, and that's absolutely right. <clears throat> Church is hard when you feel like you can't trust anyone. Now, that's what Kayla says. One of the problems. When you're at a church where you feel like you can't trust anyone, that is indicative that you are in a proposition-centric, propositionally tyrannized church because those always result in backstabbing and witch hunts. They cannot do otherwise. Um, and this is not just um, c 
confined to Christianity. This happens in when any in-group is normalized by propositional affirmation, by being of the same ilk, by being of the same ideology. If you look at Jonathan Haidt's Coddling of the American Mind and look at chapter 5, uh, he explains this. So I highly encourage you to do that. So these people who are suggesting that you're sinning or that you're not saved because you don't happen to be going to it, do not listen to those people. Those people are full of beans. And oftentimes you need time away. I want to grow and have increased agency to love and serve like we are called to as followers of Jesus. And that's another problem with going to church is that all the churches are mammon churches. What you see... Kevin, what's a mammon church? Well, we did a video called the Mammon Church where we talked about the the Logos Religio, the Ratio Religio, and the Mammon Church and all the differences between them. And I highly recommend you watch that video. The problem is the church she isn't going to and the church Alana left, I mean, they're all this. They're all Mammon Church. Everything on the bottom half. They're all that. Um... There's nothing to go to. You see, if you were to go there thinking you were getting a merit badge or brownie points or doing yourself any spiritual good just for being at a church like that, you are deceiving yourself. There's no edification there. Especially if you're stage three or stage four. <clears throat> so I highly recommend that you watch that. Um... Yeah, they are in a, <laughs> they want to say that you're probably unsaved or whatever. Those, those people in those churches are just lost in the sauce. Absolutely. And I don't know, because we're in a society that's left hemisphere dominant and a meaning crisis, I don't know if those people will ever wake up and come out of that. I don't know if they ever will. But don't let that stop you, you see. They, um, and this is, this also speaks to the concept of internalizing your locus of authority. Stage three, your locus of authority is external. It's in religious books. It's in traditions. It's in the pastor. It's in Brother Melms. It's in the denomination. It's all these external things. You allow them to tell you more about what your path should be because you haven't honed your emotions and experience. Well, when you get your emotions and your experience honed in pretty good, your locus of authority tends to internalize when you get through stage four and into stage five. Stage four is when it starts to turn over. Well, when you leaving stage three, kind of going into stage four, is when it starts to turn over and you start to have an internalized locus of authority to where when people tell you things like this, that it was suggested that I'm sinning and probably aren't saved. If that impacts you, you have an externalized locus of authority and it's indicative that you are you are either still in stage three or still struggling to break free of that aspect of being stage three. Okay, And that's something you want to get away from. Those people's videos, the video, I just saw a comment, something, somebody about talking about videos. Those people's comments about you they are trying to bring you back down to their level. Do not let it happen. So she wants to grow and have increased agency to love and serve like we are called as Jesus Christ followers. So Mammon Church is no place for that kind of desire anyway. That sounds like a pretty good orientation to be on. And it sounds like you're at the place where you're realizing that Mammon Church is not where that's going to happen. And then the sixth slide that's five of six this i forgot to reorder this one cut paste those things she this is the last paragraph she says for a while i've been pretty involved in the local church but feel so tired a lot it's like having to separate theology from actions and i can't do that they are together that's very interesting that she says this so trying to be involved and I think this if it's the same local church where they're you know doing a systematic theology study on John MacArthur stuff she's believing the Bible but all this theology is from MacArthur instead of scripture and so it's like there's this clash there 
She wants to grow and have actions that are uh, following Christ, but there's this theology that's from MacArthur instead of Scripture. And she sees that clash, and she, she can't do that. So that's, that's something you need to listen to. Emailer who wrote me this, listen to that. That's that's a good clash to notice. Like I, that's that those things are separate. They don't go together. Listen to that, and don't let somebody try to tell you that they do go together. Don't let somebody gaslight you out of your own sense making, make you feel like you're the sinner, you're the one going crazy, or you know you need some kind of expertise or something like that. Whenever I'm with the little kids, I sometimes think to myself that if what they teach is true, there's no way to know which are elect and which are reprobates. Now, a Calvinist will not tell you this, but I will tell you that is absolutely spot on what you would expect to think as a result of Calvinistic thinking. Now, the Calvinists, they really work on the presentation, smoothing things over, polishing things over, wordsmithing things. They don't want you dealing with kids and thinking about all this stuff. About They don't want you actually following through the implications of the doctrines. They want you to separate, oh no, we treat the kids as if, you know, we don't know who the elect are and who they aren't. Or some of them say, if you're born into a believing family, that means you're elect. And they have all this, they just make stuff up basically. Now, they may be following a guy who made it up 300 years ago, but they still, it's just made up stuff. They just make this stuff up to try to overcome these obvious, that is an obvious implication. And you who sent me this email, you are wise for recognizing that that is the actual outcome and the Calvinists will try to talk you out of it. And it's not that you don't understand Calvinism, it's that they're trying to, they're, they're trying to get you to doubt your own sense making and they want to have it both ways. They want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to have theology which obviously results in this while at the same time denying that it results in that. And if you don't, you know, join that chasm, if you don't reconcile that chasm yourself, then there's something wrong with you. That's how the game is played. And that's why people think they're crazy. And they're not. That is exactly the kind of thing you need to be recognizing. The same would go for infants. We don't know which ones are elect and which ones are reprobate. Now, different Calvinists have different doctrines for infants and babies and those below the age of accountability and all that nonsense, but it's all just hogwash. It's all just, it's either made up by them or made up by Calvinists, you know, maybe a couple hundred years before them. Doesn't matter, it's still all made up. There's no Bible for anything like that. I don't think that Calvinists who are more educated than me would think like that. And that sometimes feels like I'm going crazy. Now, that's the problem. When you say more educated than me, no. Your person who emailed me, do not disparage your own sense making. You are firing on all cylinders with these observations. You are spot on. The Calvinists who are more educated than you, that doesn't mean smarter. It doesn't mean more intelligent. Okay? It means more brainwashing. Okay? is essentially what Calvinists are... In every case, if you are a Calvinist, you are educated beyond your intelligence, okay? So you're actually accessing your intelligence, they're accessing their education. But they're using their cleverness to try to smooth things over. You say, I don't think that Calvinists who are more educated than me would think like that. No, they know, they know that that's the implication. But they've learned to smooth it over and present it more palatably to where they have they have reconciled the chasm and fathom in some wordsmith equivocating word game way, some subtle way. Um, and you just the only difference between you and them is that you don't have a need to put so much cleverness behind how that's worded. You can just come out and say it plainly, but they have to like really dance around it because they're trying to make it look good. And then she says sometimes it feels like I'm going crazy. And that is them gaslighting you. They make you feel crazy if you deny the palatable reframing of their terrible doctrines. Their doctrines are terrible. State them as terribly as they are. And when they try to make you feel like you're the one going crazy because you decide to call a spade a spade, you're going to call things like they are? 
and you're the one going crazy, do not put up with that. That is gaslighting you. And that's the same thing that's happening to so many other people that I talk to on the phone and messages and emails. And they tell me that as they're leaving the Calvinistic system, they get made to feel like they're the bad guy or they don't make sense or they're being divisive. They're either sinful or crazy or something else. That is exactly what a narcissistic spouse does to their, to their partner. It's exactly what they do. They make them feel like they're going crazy. Calvinists have terrible doctrines. And when, they, and when you call them on it, it's not that you don't understand Calvinism. You're just not wording it and equivocating and playing word games like they are and trying to be as subtle as they are. They want it to be presented more subtly. And when you present it without the subtlety, they just don't like how that comes across. It's, it's, it's a like thing. You are not going crazy. Keep, keep calling a spade a spade. Keep calling it like it is. Damon Nomad says, I've always regarded Calvinists as being rather unintelligent, but I've never been one. So that could just be me. <laughs> yeah, Calvinists are very formulaic. They, they're, some of them can come up with clever post hoc rationalizations that take you back to the formula, but uh, there's uh, nothing innovative or new. There's nothing original. They, they, can't, they can't generate an original thought or spark insight. Okay? It's all about towing the line to the ideological formula. <clears throat> My husband agrees with me about Calvinism, but is not as distressed about it as I have been. But I think about how I've been crying and stressed about it so much has been affecting him. Would you have any advice for my situation? Thank you for your love and service for the body of Christ. And so the advice for the situation. <clears throat> yeah, so much. Um, first of all, don't let the Calvinists gaslight you and make you think like you're going crazy. Second of all, stay in touch. Stay in touch with your experience and your emotions. And keep calling things like you see them. Okay? That is your, that is your ticket to truth. And then keep saying how you really see things. And don't feel the need to capitulate to any kind of what you think anybody else thinks is the correct thing to say. Okay, that's simulated thinking, that's formulaic thinking, that is not what we want to do. All right? Um, you're going to want to understand developmental growth stages of humans and of humankind in general. So I advocate so many things. Um, things that have helped me understand the path that I should take, things like the work of Jordan Peterson and Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, the 50-part series by John Verveke. Uh, things you can get your hands on, Jordan Hall, Daniel Schmackenberger, those kinds of things. And when it comes to scripture itself, we have a biblical interpretation playlist on this channel that I highly recommend. And I highly recommend that you look on this channel at our Christian Cognition playlist I don't know how long you've been listening to the channel, but look at the Christian Cognition playlist where it takes talks through a bunch of these things. And we just started a new playlist on growth. There's a Christian growth playlist um, that we started putting things into videos on growth and development. Okay, And without giving you a whole bunch of books to read, understand if you just watch the videos that we have on growth here on this channel, you should get a pretty good inkling of where you are. So what you want to do is you want to figure out where you are on your own growth and development cycle as far as some of these models are concerned. And then figure out what your trajectory forward looks like and what you can do. Now, I'm not going to go into specific prescriptive type things right now because there are a lot of people on the channel who are not ready for it. And I don't want them to think, like when we were independent Baptists, we thought that not having a TV in our house would, uh, would make you holy or something like that. It doesn't do that. It doesn't do It could be that one person who had a lot of success never watched TV, but not watching TV doesn't make you like them. See? 
Um, so it's, I don't want somebody to get the idea that there's some kind of formula where you can plug and play that's a one size fits all that's perfect for any particular person. But I highly recommend some of the resources that I just mentioned. Uh, delve into those, and especially on this channel, the stuff on growth, stuff on Mammon Church, Jesus and Fractal Salvation. Some of those things. Um, I'm looking through the comments now. Let's see if there's something in the comments that might be interesting. You'll never hear a Calvinist preach two Lupin hospitals, hospices, funerals, prisons, street corners. They such a belief system would be seen as repulsive. They won't, te they won't teach their distinctives in there for sure. They always resort to the public face of Calvinism wears a Christian mask. You have to have a really good memory to be a Calvinist to remember all those terms. And it's all that formulaic stuff. And you look at people like J.D. Martin or James White, and they're really good at recall. They're really good at simulated thinking. They're really good at recall, but they're not good at insight cultivation. <coughs> we must be cautious listening to anyone on YouTube, and I would, I would say, yeah, even me too. I know some. Uh, I know he has some charismatic esque background, but I think he addressed a lot of topics that have been addressed as well. And they're probably mentioning somebody. I'm not sure who they're talking about. Christians are scared of having their own locus of control because Christians constantly say non Christians are lost because they follow themselves. Yeah. So what happens there is moralism gets into play, and when you talk about internalizing your locus of authority and your locus of control. Um, people start bringing in the concepts of pride and humility and self-exaltation, not, not realizing. I like to take people back to the movie World War Z. <coughs> Excuse me. Realizing there is no external locus of authority or, or formulaic morality that could have been imposed on the main character to get him to make the decisions that he made. He had to have an internalized locus of authority locus of authority in order to make all the proper decisions and that is how life is going to be for you if you are going to grow <clears throat> i like mark de jesus but also feel he's still a little propositional that's that's one of my problems with listening to christian preachers and stuff in general i've completely become almost entirely disenchanted with it somebody when people recommend people i i go check them out eagerly and um almost always disappointed immediately. It's it's just more propositional stuff. Maybe presented in a different way, but it's still still the same stuff. Let's see what the last comments are. The arrogance coupled with deception makes it hard for me to even converse with my ex Baptist OSAS Calvinist thinking. It's so convoluted. Oh yeah. Yeah, Calvinists are extremely egotistical as well. Uh, there's, have you seen Kevin's video? There's no salvation in, in Calvinism. I would correct that and say it's called, there's no gospel in Calvinism. I haven't made one called, there's no salvation in Calvinism. Um, all right. So I think we're going to stop there and I appreciate everybody who's commenting, everybody who was watching had a few chiming in and uh, I think this kinds of things are really important. And also to the reader of, to the writer of the email that sent in, thanks for your email. And I hope this was helpful. Anyone else, if you want your questions answered, send in an email. And if I don't reply to your email, <clears throat> I get a lot of them. So I, it's hard to keep up with, but some I think would make good content. I might answer you in a video like this and I will, keep you anonymous to the degree that I can as we do this. And as we sign off, I want to remind you, uh, just say thanks for those who are supporting the channel. If you get a chance to do so, it would help us set aside more time, space, resources, and energy to make these videos, uh, PayPal and Venmo. So that being said, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.